Adam. Uh, I'm Adam Gaik from Eurochambers, and I work <clears throat> there on uh, topics such as uh, education, training, migration, <clears throat> and employment policies. Um, so, as uh, at the sessions, we are asked to uh, present with what uh, Europe is doing. I also wanted to say that although I'm going to present you with some of the European uh, opportunities, of course, I do not represent um, the European Commission here, just your chambers, but uh, we are also going to tell you a little bit how the chambers can, can use uh, uh, <clears throat> these opportunities uh, for, um, uh, for themselves. Um, okay, so I will try to do it within uh, 15 minutes, as Daniel asked. So let's uh, let's kick off. So first, I would like to share some uh, bits with you on what are EU policies on education and employment. So these are two separate uh, chunks of policy. So first of all, as Daniel already mentioned, and what's also quite important in the context of uh, a discussion on the role of these policies in the EU is to be aware of what are the EU competences on this policy. So EU, as you may know, has three different uh, um, levels of competency. So there are uh, competencies that are um, um, that are supporting, that where EU can only support some policy, but uh, they cannot harmonize. Uh, they can harmonize them. There are uh, shared competences where EU can legislate. Uh, within the frame that is given to, uh, to it, and they can harmonize policies within the member states. And there are also uh, competences where EU has a full competence, and uh, this is where the EU has a full um, legislative power and can harmonize uh, um, these policies. So um, in terms of employment, it falls under social policy, which is like the second one pointed on my slide. And there EU has a shared competence, um, but only in a very limited uh, in a very limited area. Of course, there's like lots of things that you cannot um, regulate on social policy, which are um, things connected to uh, um, equality, uh, to uh, salaries, many things. But there are there are small things, small small part where you can actually legislate, and uh, these are things connected to uh, employment itself. And then there is also um, the supporting competence on, on education, vocational training, what is the most important for us. So there EU does not really make like law legislation, but more like uh, policies. So um, supporting programs, uh, supporting frameworks, um, lots of projects and so on. And this is where uh, we, are, uh, we are active. Okay, so then what are uh, what are the most important topics in the EU right now concerning this uh, these areas? So first of all, I would like to start with the adult learning and vocational training. So um, chambers are traditionally involved a lot in vocational training provision, uh, which is of course a natural area of cooperation between uh, schools and companies. But also adult learning is an important topic because it's uh, basically training of the workforce. And this is um, uh, this is an area of education that uh, is becoming more significant for uh, in the EU policies uh, recently. Uh, for example, given if if you look at um, for example Erasmus program that we are going to talk about today a bit later on, um, like the funding for this uh, uh, for for this type of learning uh, significantly increased. Um, and there is also some policy initiative on on other learning that are worth to know. For, uh, for, for example, if you have a look at this um, part at the bottom of my slide, uh, which is the Porto Summit Declaration. So Porto Summit was a social summit, so summit where the um, heads of states and, and heads of governments were discussing the future of the EU in terms of social policies. And they made three commitments that they're going to uh, work on together to achieve by 2030. And one of them is to, to, to achieve 60% of adults in the EU to be in training every year. So this means that like this, uh, adult learning, so for companies basically uh, workforce le le learning is going to increase, what is <clears throat> of course good for us, but uh, we have to look how to make it with, uh, uh, for the good of the, of, the, of the business sector. And this is why, as you can see also, your chambers in, uh, released an in position papers on, on uh, micro-credentials framework and individual learning accounts uh, initiative, 
So these are two biggest initiatives in this field of the EU right now, and uh, where we advocate, for, for example, for keeping these training opportunities uh, relevant for uh, labor market needs. Okay, the next part is, for example, labor migration. It's also a big part. Um, you may uh, have heard, I'm pretty sure as in Malta, I guess it's a big topic. Uh, EU released last year a new pact for migration asylum and also has a big part that um, uh, relates to labor migration. So how to achieve a uh, smooth economic migration to Europe that uh, relates to employment needs of the European companies. And there is like a set of uh, different um, um, uh, legal initiative because here un until some uh, part uh, you can legislate. Um, there are some um, there are some ideas how to make it work better, how to uh, link better with uh, potential migrants in the, their countries of origin, how to train them on spot, and how to make sure that the companies that um, want to employ these migrants have do it easier than it, ha it is happening right now. Uh, and another part that I wanted to show you are two big initiatives from last year as well. So sure was. Uh, uh, immediate response of the EU to the pandemic. It was a support for uh, uh, short-time work schemes uh, in the EU. Um, and this was like actually one of the first uh, um, instruments that uh, was uh, initiated by EU for the recovery. And another one was the European Skills Agenda, which has like 12 different actions. And one of them will be supporting entrepreneurial education uh, all over Europe, especially for women. So it's also something what, uh, or at what we are looking at. Okay, so now quickly through labor market trends. Um, so uh, this is uh, what is quite important for us because we are aware that there is lots of uh, things happening in the labor market and, uh, and, and we have to deal with it uh, because otherwise companies will be left out of uh, um, hands and brains to work. Uh, so this uh, diagram is something we created two years ago in your chambers uh, when we were for our advocacy purposes. And this was made before the pandemic. Of course, now it would look a little bit different, uh, but then already we were thinking about stuff, you know, like digitalization, automation of jobs, of course, climate change, um, increased mobility of people, aging society, and so on. So these are like this kind of traditional trends that has been have been observed for years and uh, many policies have been targeting them. However, um, yeah, so as you know, um, there is, um, yeah, there is the, there are these trends and also there is this uh, quite interesting theory that is uh, getting a lot of uh, spot now in the EU, which is 3Ds. So um, it talks about jobs that are most likely and should be actually replaced by automat uh, by auto uh, by automation or digitalization. So these are three Ds. So dangerous, dirty, and dull jobs. Um, so this is probably like the, the direction that uh, this is going to take uh, in the EU. Um, however, yeah, we also see like these trends, like you know, digital skills. Uh, uh, which on very different levels have different kind of uh, uh, needs. And um, this is also something what has been there for, for quite a long time and was accelerated by, by the pandemic. Um, yeah, uh, okay, so I think I'm talking about most of this. So yeah, the societal changes. And now um, a little bit about what has changed after the pandemic, because this was actually the big uh, milestone in the development of the EU policies in the social affairs. So uh, first of all, the biggest change was the teleworking. Yeah? So of course, lots of people started working from home. Uh, in some countries, it hit like around 50% um, of, of the workforce. So it was, uh, it was a lot. And um, of course, this needed some uh, regulation. So now there is like lots of this uh, discussion how this should be regulated. However, as you can see here at this diagram, Teleworking is not that new uh, that new phenomenon because uh, um, actually uh, teleworking has been an increasing, but of course slowly and gradually, trend in the EU before. However, not enough efforts were made to, to regulate it and then it brought some problems either when the pandemic hit. However, given uh, the already increasing interest uh, for, for teleworking before the pandemic, and the fact that it was it's widely accepted now, we uh, we we see that it will become um, some kind of normality, um, especially in the 
uh, especially in the in the hybrid form. Um, okay, and here a little bit about the skills gaps. So, um, um, as you know, skills gaps are a huge issue, and we made a, a survey uh, in your chambers. We make it every year. Probably you know you know it. Your your chambers economic survey every year, and it actually showed the, the addition from the last year that the skills gap um, the skills gaps uh, in the uh, aftermath of the of the pandemic they even grew. What is um, a bizarre trend because um, uh, the pandemic, of course, caused increased unemployment, so it means that more people were in the market. However, the skills gaps grew even more, what means that like our skills delivery is really detached from what is needed. And, and here we can see it's a very interesting report of McKinsey Global Institute from 2017, so also a month before pandemic, um, concerning um, what skills will be in need uh, in the perspective until 2030, because now in the EU, all also, everything is being done in the perspective of 2030. So as you see, like skills like, um, of course, digital skills, advanced and basic are like most important ones, but also uh, lots of social and emotional skills. For example, entrepreneurship, leadership or creativity as well in terms of cognitive skills will be uh, much in need. And one of our main advocacy points is like to make sure that school and university curricula and also training curricula for the adults they take into account uh, all of the skills. Otherwise, we will be uh, left out with um, gradually growing uh, skills gaps in the labor market. Okay, I'm looking at my time. I still have five minutes. Uh, so then a little bit about European opportunities. I think it's quite an important part for you. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, Erasmus program 2021, 2027. So this is the perspective we are at now. So here I just put some numbers because I wanted to show you um, like how much the funding grew. And it's not only just, you know, like to show you like uh, one of the huge numbers in the EU budget is not that relevant for you. I think it's very relevant because it shows that opportunities for companies are enormously bigger. So uh, the, current, uh, the current budget uh, for the for Erasmus program is almost twice as big as the, as the one before. And as you can see that at 21.5% um, of the current funding is for vocational education. And it was 17% for the previous one. So it was not only like smaller percent, but also like the number now is much bigger. So it means that there's much more money. And why I'm, why I'm, uh, I'm saying that is that uh, the new program, um, similar as the, the one before, um, allows for the companies to uh, participate in these mobilities. So um, what means here is that uh, um, uh, what means here maybe yeah we'll go to uh, around the accreditation. What means here that in terms of the vocational education, companies can apply for hosting or receiving uh, mobilities from abroad. Um, of course, if they are uh, involved in vocational education. Uh, however, as, uh, as I said before, as in the previous uh, perspective, this was quite uh, um, limited. Now, at least half as many companies can participate in that because there is twice that much money for, uh, for this activity. So I would, uh, I would encourage you, if you're involved in vocational education training, that you can get uh, accredited uh, for, for Erasmus uh, Mobilities because you need to get an accreditation. Um, so it's uh, um, this window of opportunity for, for applying for accreditation is until 19th of, of October, and uh, you do it at your national agency for Erasmus. So we spoke about this with Daniel before, so I guess he will be able to uh, direct you to, to, um, um, to that uh, agency. Uh, so there's like one month to do it. However, it's quite, um, quite, good, uh, quite a good opportunity, I believe. Another interesting thing, uh, which is like very recent and like sorry for not maybe very concrete information on that, but it was announced last week and not yet everything is known. However, uh, at, um, at, a, at her speech, Ursula von der Leyen last week uh, announced that there will be like a new program uh, uh, for mobilities called ALMA and um, it's going to offer um, kind of like internships for recent graduates who are neither in training nor or employment um, uh, at the moment. 
and this will be like for several months. So of course, this program will be directed towards companies because it's not going to be a mobility between schools, as Erasmus says, but this will be a program where companies will be able to receive people from other countries. So this is a very interesting program and I also will um, keep uh, keep Daniel and um, the, the Maltese Chamber in the, in the loop on what are the developments about this. Uh, there is no accreditation for this yet because it was shortly announced. However, it is uh, estimated is going to start to uh, work uh, at spring. So uh, I think it will be also interesting opportunity for, for you. And also like for the, for the very last, there is of course a recovery plan for Malta. As you may uh, as you may know it, uh, I, I had a look at uh, the, the skills and employment part of it, and I saw that there is uh, some focus on digital skills, on low skilled adults, uh, but also there will be a center for vocational education uh, established in Malta with uh, priority given to tourism. So it seems that uh, this recovery plan will bring some reforms in terms of um, skills for for the labor markets of the future. So hopefully it's going to work out well and uh, companies will also be able to, uh, to, uh, to give some direction to, this, to these reforms. And yeah, that's uh, in short and I, within the time, I hope, Daniel. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Yes, like we're, we're running against time, but at least whilst um, you were doing the presentation, I was in touch with my colleagues and we agreed to extend the, the session with another 10 minutes. So. And at least recovers the part we lost because of the delay before we started in the session. Okay, so let's get right to it. Um, what I'd like to suggest now uh, is if it's possible for you to use your phone and log into a website which is called uh, menti.com. So it's www.menti.com. -E My colleague Sarah is going to share a screen now where there will be a code. It's very easy. We we'll just need to um, insert this code in the homepage. Sarah, is it possible to share it already? And basically, what will happen is that yes, we will sharing see... it now, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, what what will happen is that you will see uh, some questions which will uh, start coming up on your phone, where you will be able to kind of vote. Okay. And um, is this, is it is it okay? Uh, yes. Very good. There's the code. Okay, so if you put your code in the phone, then you will start seeing the questions that we've prepared in advance. And it's quite interesting that we will be able to gauge your opinions um, through the voting. So I think that, that we, I have uh, prepared like three, four questions, uh, but not just for the voting, also for the purpose of discussion. Uh, I think first, perhaps we, we might uh, want to address the elephant in the room, right? Which are the challenges uh, currently faced by our labor market. We've heard in the presentation issues relating to digitalization, automation, issues, social issues relating to um, aging society. We have uh, an increasing trend of flexible work arrangements, remote working, etc. So um, let's let's do the votes first, and then we'll open up for discussion as to uh, a better understanding of your views of these uh, challenges and what your uh, opinions for solutions may be. Also, if possible, in the context of what you would expect the European Union to do with, with, with these topics. Sarah, is it possible to see the first um, question? Okay, I'm going to um, avoid from voting myself so that I won't uh, put my own influence on the vote. Okay, so which labor market trends will have the greatest impact on your business? They're a bit small on the screen, so perhaps I should read them. Uh, automation, digitalization, green transition, flexible work arrangements, aging society, increased mobility of people, uh, importing labor from third markets, and remote working. Okay, very good. We started seeing, we have three votes there. We should have more coming up. Very well, okay, quite balanced. Let's see, we should have, okay, we have, okay, you see it moving there, the preferences. Very good. I'm going to give a few more seconds to see to see if we have more. Okay, it's quite a balanced choice between automation, the green transition, and flexible work arrangements, and nearly uh, up to the same level, digitalization and remote working. Okay, let's go to the second one, the second question, which is 
linked to it, uh, what skills will your employees need to acquire for your business to be more competitive? I assume this could possibly have a similar result to the first because the questions are similar, but not exactly the same. So you have options between digital skills, green skills, entrepreneurial skills, leadership and management skills, sector specific skills, creativity, physical and manual skills. Okay, very good. So it looks like digital skills and leadership and management skills have a strong preference, followed by sector specific skills and entrepreneurial skills, which is interesting. Creativity. Okay, so we have some changes. Now digital skills has the utmost uh, support in terms of uh, skills that you would, your employees to have for the competitiveness of your business. Very good. Okay, so it's not a surprise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay, let's let's go back for now, or, or, or we won't answer this for now. Let's just have a discussion. Let's have five minutes discussion. If anyone would like to take the floor on these current challenges and um, your views as to what we should be doing about addressing them and what the EU could be doing more uh, to address these issues. Anyone who would like to take the floor, I invite to raise hand. You could press reactions at the bottom right of your screen. And then at the bottom of that pop-up, you have raise hand. I know it's hard for uh, someone to break the ice. So if there's any first volunteer. Maybe I will just add something um, because um... As I said, that uh, I'm, I'm not surprised about the digital skills, that, that they are the, the ones that are the most uh, frequently chosen answer, uh, because there's also, it's, it's something what is really needed. Yeah, there's like lots of uh, um, businesses going online and, and uh, lots of technologies are also developing very fast. So we also have to keep up to that. However, um, one interesting uh, initiative that the EU is working on now, and we are also participating at, uh, as a cons uh, um, consultative uh, um, stakeholder, um, was, is going to be um, um, certification of digital skills. So something what will work similar to what probably we all know as the certificate for, uh, um, for the knowledge of languages. Uh, that you know, with all these levels like uh, B2, C1, blah blah blah. So uh, EU is working on a similar thing, uh, which uh, will um, assess knowledge of of digital skills. So uh, this is going to be probably in two three years. It's like a big project, uh, but it's like one of the answers to uh, make um, employment of people more reliable because they will have um, the certificates from like an independent assessment center. Also an interesting point I came across with was preparing for this session is a report by Sedefop, whereby they estimate that one fifth of jobs created as of today until 2030 will be taken up by, auto by automation. Mm -hmm. Again, the, the impact of digitalization on, on, on the world of work, not in, in a very long time, but within the next decade. Okay, um, do we have anyone else who would like to share any opinions, any ideas before we move to the next topic, which is more on mobility? Okay, Alison? Yes, I have an observation. I don't have an answer, but more of a question. So what we're seeing here that everyone recognizes that digital skills is of uh, primary importance. When we look at the commission priorities and the priorities that are coming at any level, Digitization always features on most of the programs of the EU, and even in funding programs, the priority is clearly there for everyone. I think the challenge is in the matching of the timing and making sure that these, whatever funding available, whatever policies that the EU is trying to push are made available for the member states to capitalize on, used to, at the right time. If there are too many, if the EU does not manage to act fast to address the issues of bureaucracy, we will carry on lagging behind. So the question is how fast? So the priorities are there, we know where we have to go, we know where we have to focus. The question is, are, is the EU collectively reacting fast enough to these challenges to make sure that we don't miss the boat and we don't lag behind um, the United States in these, uh, in these uh, matters? Mm. Yeah, um, if I can address this, of course, I'm, as I said, I'm not representing the EU institutions here. 
However, like I, I, I think um, what the EU's people would say is that like they create all these opportunities for funding for the recovery program, which I guess we can say that like now it's great that this money are there because they are really like to create some uh, programs and digitalization is like one of the main priorities of the recovery plans. However, like this recovery uh, uh, money are for the next three years. And uh, the question is like how countries are going to use it because they're just uh, there for three years. Of course, there are different priorities after the pandemic. And uh, after these three years, there, uh, the, the, this additional funding will be over. And, and then the, if we are um, after these three years, uh, and uh, if we end up without, you know, my major and reforms on uh, the provision of digital skills, it will be really a problem, and there won't be that much money for for it. Yeah. So I, I guess it's uh, there is really some money, and there's like these programs on digital uh, digitalization as well. Um, so I, I guess it's possible that if uh, if countries are uh, are, are using this money well to to address this. Yeah, of course, it's never enough and, and never everything, but but there are opportunities. So I, I, I think that the main problem now would be like uh, how this money are being spent now. I, I know that Malta is now uh, has now approved the recovery plan, I, I think uh, around yeah, September. So I, I think you should you should uh, expect yeah like uh, these reforms now. So I hope that they will work. But uh, if not, then it's going to be like a lost chance, unfortunately. Okay, let's um, hear Christian. Hi, good morning. Um, uh, so I'm Christian. Um, I come from the aerospace domain, just to put it into frame. However, what I think uh, I'm going to observe now can apply across the board. I think um, uh, we have we go to a lot of you know uh, webinars such as this one and, and other meetings in different fora and uh, obviously everyone knows what needs to happen but unfortunately especially locally i feel we are too slow to react and i'm going to explain um, my reasoning um uh, especially when it comes to digital skills Everyone knows that the digital, the digital environment and the, and the digital domain is accelerating very, very fast. Okay, it accelerates. Uh, if you ever heard of Moore's law, where the performance of computer chips double every two years, so um, uh, obviously it's always accelerating. And if I may observe, it is running away from us in the sense that the curricula of the different bodies across our island and and maybe even in other European countries and the UK. It's like a change management exercise on a macro scale, kind of. So a lot of times these bodies are, too, are being too slow to react, to, to uh, remember that these bodies act as gate, gatekeepers, uh, as the people who decide what the, the learner should know. Um, and a lot of times they are being too slow to react to this changing environment, which require the digital skills. Especially, for example, even in my domain, um, in the in the aviation domain, maybe locally we are even even behind in terms of the traditional um, curricula. Because remember, for for accredited institutions, it takes years to change a curriculum sometimes, and this is too fast. The, the, the environment is too fast. So, from the side of the European Union, although maybe they have limited you know sovereignty on what could change. I think it needs to incentivize um, uh, curricula or, or maybe pro policies and, and, and processes for the mm -hmm. curricula to change faster if required. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, here I think, you know, as, uh, as I said at the very beginning, like the, the problem is this competence of the EU. Yeah, like you cannot really, you know, like impose change of curricula, but uh, that's why like there's lots of these programs and, uh, and frameworks. However, in what, what you're saying is something what we in your chambers have been talking a lot recently is um, uh, these are tools for um, updating the, the curricula faster. So, for example, this uh, skills um, intelligence tools that, uh, you know, collect like lots of information about uh, um, employment needs, uh, they are very important and they exist in many places. Like, for example, there is the one called uh, Skills Ovate uh, by Sadafob, 
that collects uh, data from on, uh, online uh, vac uh, like the uh, vacancies posted online. And then they, they, they present, you know, like what kind of skills are in need this year. And then it's like a great source of information on what especially digital skills are, are in need. And uh, then the problem is that, you know, like there are there is data, there are findings, there is some funding. And, and then uh, little is happening, as you're saying. Yeah? So, so here there is this really important to make sure that this funding and this data are being applied and this curricula are changed. Because like, of course, school institutions are very conservative. They don't want to change their curricula and often they're outdated. And the growing skills gaps, they only, only show this. Yeah? So as you say, everybody knows it, but then the issue is this implementation. Yeah? And, and I think we all have to really push uh, and uh, national governments and local governments to make sure they do it because it's in their hands because education is usually in the hands of the local governments. Thank you, Christian and Adam. Isabella, before we move to the next topic. Hi, um, so basically, obviously, I come from the tourism sector and it's quite, uh, you know, um, positive that we see the recovery plan the motor focus, vocational priority tourism, and obviously the low skilled adults. Um, as you all know, with the pandemic, I mean, the tourism has been hit very badly and we have had an exodus of all the foreign workers and even locals that have changed industry completely. Um, COVID has exposed our industry as being a very vulnerable um, workplace um, because obviously with the shutdowns we had last year, we had this year, um, so it's been very challenging. The foreign workers we had were here because we needed them, because we had to have all of these workers, plus the locals, to sustain the 2.9 million tourism figures in 2019. Um, obviously, um, the demand was there, you know, so the, the availability needed to be had. Um, we have now kind of stepped back to even see where we are now and we are going to do this exercise as tourism to see where we want to be um, in the next years with tourism do we want those figures those numbers because to to accommodate the tourism arrivals we need workers it's a very uh, good initiative uh, the ursula von der Leyen, the new erasmus because this can probably facilitate you know the, the work exposure we used to have this with with you know that's uh, we used to get as, um, tourism students coming over from Poland, you know, on placements. Um, they used to come for a few weeks, but it's kind of finished and it's not existent anymore. We don't see it so much, obviously, now with COVID, with the travel restrictions. So uh, the timing for this to be coming into line in spring is quite good because spring is Easter time and the pre season where the staff can, you know, um, we can bring these workers in, but we can also bring them either as work experiences or even offer them a summer job through the work experience they do, and not, not deviating them maybe from their studies, because we do get um, students coming over just for the summer months from the European Union. Um, the COVID travel restrictions, we've had, we've seen challenges with this because we have been trying to source out because we do have this very serious situation on the island with staffing. Um, there are establishments, businesses that are actually not opening all week or reduce hours, reduce areas because they don't have the capability of servicing these areas with staff. So the challenges are very big for us in industry. Um, in the survey, obviously, I, I ticked the three boxes for me in tourism. This is leadership and management, sectorial specific because it is tourism and we, are, we don't really do remote working. <laughs> we are service. So it's a hands-on industry and it's a very big percentage of you know the workforce on the island as well and the physical manual skills and obviously um because this is what we look for um i think i believe that you know with collaboration through maybe this new erasmus and what is in place with even uh, digital skills are important because we do use you know uh, tablets we do use but these are all in-house training to the systems. Every hotel, every restaurant has. So we do our in-house training as well. Um, but the availability, the possibility of having, you know, workforce coming into the island, because what we have, and I agree with the previous um, 
colleague regarding education in Malta and where we we push our you know syllabuses and and you know, we are an island that depends on you know everything that is import export services to tourism um manufacture you're dealing with with um, EU countries and the world but in reality when it comes to services be it not just tourism be it medical we do bring in nurses doctors um, we don't have enough for the amount of people we have um, living here because we do the, the, the community that comes to work here is an added to the nearly 450 500,000 population so we're the size of a town in Europe but then again we, we need the, the, the workers and we need the assistance that can come from Europe so that's my take on on this one yeah, thank you, Isabella, very much for saying this, because also we are going to speak with the commissioner about this ALMA program. So uh, it's, it's very interesting what you're what you're saying about uh, this uh, goal of um, balancing labor mobility with, with this program a little bit. So thank you very much for the statement. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, in fact, I think um, Isabella's comment already touched upon the next point that um, we're planning to discuss, which is the aspect of mobility. So uh, let's go through the votes first and then uh, see if there's more comments um, relating to this. Okay, so the question was, uh, Erasmus and Alma Mobilities, what skills do they help acquire? I think, uh, I hope you're still connected to the Mentimeter uh, because so far we have only a few votes. So let's wait a few seconds for you to for you to uh, share your opinion there. So we have um, the following possibilities: foreign language skills, ability to adapt and act in new situations, communication skills, intercultural competences, planning and organizational skills, decision making skills, team working skills, innovative potential, and entrepreneurial skills. So we're quite spoiled with choice for the options that there are available. Okay, it seems that the, um, okay, the, 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 biggest, the biggest one there seems to be team working skills. Yeah, team working skills, which gathered seven votes and the others are quite balanced. So we're looking at the foreign language skills, the ability to adapt to new situations, uh, then intercultural competencies and communication skills. And if we had to uh, go to the second related question, uh, Sarah, please, here we're going to ask you to literally just put in one word, okay, we're going to get a map uh, based on the keywords that uh, you choose, so choose one word uh, that in your view uh, describes how mobility increases employability of workers, of course, uh, you might want to choose ones that were options in the previous question or another one which comes to mind. There we go, we start to see the words coming up. Gaps, flexibility, responsibility. Okay, let's see if there's more coming. Perhaps was, okay, independence, very good. Perhaps I'm, I'm interested to know who mentioned gaps because uh, I'm trying to understand what was meant by that. Could whoever put in gaps explain a bit further what? Was that you, Alison? Okay. Yes, I mentioned gaps. Because gaps in a particular labor market can be addressed through uh, mobility okay. workers from another, another place. So filling, right? filling gaps. So to speak, can, 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 yeah. one word, so I can. very good, very good. Okay, understood. Okay, so we have responsibility, resilience, independence. Okay, it looks like we don't have any more coming up. Um, I, I'm not okay. Uh, no, they're just turning around. I'm not sure if okay, there we have one. I'm not, I'm not sure if there's um, I choice. think it's a choice. Choice, okay, yeah, choice, very good. Uh, um, perhaps if there's anyone else who would like to share any views on the aspects of mobility, uh, it was touched upon by Isabella before we came to the actual section discussion this, but if there's anyone else who would like to share any views, raise your hand. If not, uh, we have 10 more minutes and we can uh, delve into the next topic. Okay, 
Very good. So let's go to discuss another elephant in the room, which is remote working, which is obviously uh, something which accelerated uh, during the pandemic. Pandemic. Uh, Adam referred to it as as it was like a slowly increasing trend over time. Um, but obviously now it's become a trend, and we'd like to know your views as to how you see it uh, establishing itself in the future and how it should be addressed. So uh, will your business continue applying remote working beyond the COVID-19 pandemic? Hybrid working, okay, I think we have, uh, everyone agrees on this. I should take note because one thing I did not mention is that when we go back to the plenary, I will kind of sum up the, the, the points that were raised during this, this discussion. Okay, so it looks like everybody chose hybrid working, a mix between um, working from home and working at the workplace. Could anyone share, uh, share uh, the ideas why? But let's go to the second one because I think it's also important. Uh, are there any policy or regulatory initiatives you would require from the EU to improve and or not hinder remote working? And here I explain, I'll give you an indication. Like for example, we hear Adam mentioned that the EU will soon be coming up on uh, something on teleworking, legislative wise. Uh, we hear a lot about the right to disconnect. Um, so uh, these are some things that from a business point of view, usually we look from a, let's say, defensive approach in the sense of we uh, try to uh, have the flexibility still within our operations, but I, I do not want to just put the defensive things out there. Perhaps you might have other ideas. So things you might want the EU more from a proactive side to do in terms of remote working, support, facilitation, uh, or funding opportunities. Uh, let's see what, what your thoughts are. Subsidizing remote offices. Okay. Other views? I don't see any more. There's there's only one contribution. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. Now we can see legislate on flexible working. Uh, on flexible working, there's there's already something um, which was included in the work life balance directive, which is about to be uh, enforced in Malta, I believe, this year. Um, Obviously, I don't remember the exact tiny details of the legislation, but uh, I remember uh, something on the lines of the right to ask for um, uh, for flexible work arrangements and up until which age of, of children. But it's something that if you're interested in, you could come back to me uh, bilaterally and I can provide more information on the European legislation, yeah. but this is something which is still being transposed in, in, in local mm. legislation. Here, I, I, I just wanted to add that um, this at the beginning of this year, we in your chambers published uh, um, a report on uh, female entrepreneurs uh, in the in the pandemic and like how their work was um, um, affected. And one of our main find, find, uh, fun, uh, findings was that uh, most of the legislation concerning work-life balance applies to workers, but not to entrepreneurs. And actually the group that was heavily affected was were female entrepreneurs who, whose you know, like home um, um, responsibilities didn't uh, decrease, rather increase because of the children and uh, at home and schooling and so on. Uh, and also they had to deal with, uh, with a lot. So there is uh, still probably something that will be advocating for in this in these terms. Can I ask whoever put up the last uh, comment to elaborate when you when you uh, say to localize arrangements? Uh, I, good I morning, quite... Daniel. That was me, Fabian. Oh, yes, hi. Hi, Fabian. hi, good morning. Um, so so my presence here today is is uh, because um, I chaired uh, the HR and talent thematic at the Chamber of Commerce. And uh, what this 
Tamatic has very recently done is we finalized a very broad um, consultation process with a number of industry players that are members of the chamber. And we issued a position paper by the industry on the workforce problematics that our various sectors are facing. And what I've heard this morning resonates a lot with what we published. Uh, we published this paper, it's available online. Uh, we are looking for partners now and collaborators that actually want to put some skin in the game uh, to, to, to enforce more on government and other stakeholders on the changes we need to be seeing. We believe a lot though that these changes cannot only be expected from government and the stakeholders, but the private sector itself needs mm -hmm. to continue helping itself uh, to, 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 to manage the situation. So um, the point I, I try to make here is that um, the, the, the local realities of workforce gaps, mismatches, um, educational attainments, etc., cetera, um, uh, in Malta are um, peculiar to Malta. So they are a result of the economic demographics uh, of our business units. So over 99% of our economy is made up of you know, micro, small and medium. And therefore the realities of, of our country uh, might require certain localization uh, in the sense that what, what applies for the very large enterprises will not apply for a small or, or a medium enterprise. And therefore what I am advocating is to have a level of flexibility that the local policymakers and, and industry and other stakeholders can, um, can promote um, new mechanisms such as remote working that makes sense um, within the business community, within the business context of Malta. I'm not saying that this should be a one-sided conversation, that it's just business driven. We obviously need to be working in tandem in a win-win situations with our workforce realities, but also our workforce realities are very much influenced by our cultural norms. And I think we all know uh, what our societal and cultural norms still require from uh, the female, uh, participants in our workforce. So the familial responsibilities that we have on our females are very obvious through the numbers. Unfortunately, the, the, the female working population is still very limited here in Malta. We tend to lose them out so that they can uh, cater for their family responsibilities. It's a very, it's a very uh, complex problem to solve. So what I'm trying to say is that you know, yes, of course, uh, remote working can facilitate, but we've also seen instances where it does not facilitate because one does not disconnect. Uh, um, mm -hmm. um, uh, and therefore, I think what I'm trying to say is that the societal and cultural norms and realities uh, sometimes are, are disregarded when we come out with blanket statements and blanket approaches and, you know, one regulation to fit all. So what I'm saying is that, that there needs to be an element of flexibility locally uh, to be able to design ultimately the local version of the principles uh, that 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 UGRIP would be pushing forward. Fabian, I'm very happy you made this comment because it's relevant for this topic, but it's also very relevant for the uh, panel discussion we will have uh, when we go back all together because there we're going to be discussing better regulation. So I think what you say applies more broadly, more horizontally, um, under every aspect of legislation. So it would be good if you can also raise that point during that discussion. I see Christian also raised his hand. Uh, we have five more minutes. So Christian, please proceed. And then we'll see if we have time to address one last question. But it's important that we continue giving the floor to you um, to share your views on the current topics. Christian? I, I'll just take one minute. Um, I completely agree with what, what Fabian is saying. Um, and if, if I may add um, uh, to that, I think considering the cultural uh, and the norm aspects of the Maltese population is uh, essential to maintain our competitiveness um, for businesses. Because as she said, blanket rules which are applied by the European Union across the 27 member states 
and which do not um, uh, take into account the cultural um, background and the educational background of the of the country in question uh, are bound to be a threat to our competitiveness and not help. Uh, from a practical aspect, um, uh, you know, if I, I believe that being in the office um, uh, is as a strong um, uh, has a strong influence on the culture of my organization. So while I do not completely, you know, shed the idea of remote working, I think the, the, you have to always strike the balance and that balance depends on where you are. That is my point. Thank you, Christian. So we have three minutes. I think we can um, put one last vote. Uh, let's see if, yes. Okay, this is very straightforward. We've discussed the competences of the EU in the areas of education, training, and employment, where we mentioned that very much the EU is limited in its power as to what can, it can do. So if we had to put a, a blanket question like that, uh, would you prefer if you had more powers or that subsidiarity should prevail? I think in the room we had comments on both sides. We had Christian earlier saying that you should take a more proactive role when it comes to curricula. We had Fabienne mentioning that member states should have more flexibility as to how they implement legislation. So um, let's see, this, this, is, this could be interesting. Okay, I think we can expect a few more. I'm taking notes as well, because as I mentioned, I'll, I'll give a brief overview of our discussion in the plenary uh, very soon. So the vote is four to three, quite balanced. Um, so, okay. Very good. I think um, unless there's anyone else who in the last two minutes would like to, okay, goes up to five. If anyone else would like to share any other views, I think we'll just wait for one minute before we're all uh, brought back to the main room. Um, so I just thank you. First of all, thank you all uh, for uh, being with us in this session. Thank you for your contributions. I think, I think it was an interesting discussion. Now we'll hear a little bit in the plenary what was discussed also in the other sessions and we'll have the final uh, discussion in a plenary mode uh, with um, uh, Lina from Eurochambers, who will discuss a bit more broadly about better regulation and how the EU could be more efficient in in working uh, for business uh, interests. Okay.